Um, we've got quite a bit of content to cover today. So um, if, if you have a pressing question you'd like to put in the chat, um, please do so and we can respond, follow up with you after we do the webinar, but there may not be too much interaction today with the chat going forward um, so that we can get through what we've prepared to uh, make sure that you guys feel really supported um, when it comes to uh, this performance management. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, improving performance and it's quite timely as we'll see here in just a minute. So um, hopefully all of you are familiar with HB 104 and um, some of the changes that are being implemented that impact you directly as supervisors. And you might be wondering, okay, <laughs> what exactly is my role and what am I um, able to do and what do I have in my control to help support my employees and then what am I required to do now with this new law so um, that will be the content for today like Shane mentioned this session is going to be recorded um, and then we'll post it of course to our YouTube channel um, so you guys can view it in the future as well um, I'll do a quick introduction I'm Sydney I am fairly new to the DHRM leadership team um, I've been here since September and doing off the shelves, probably one of my favorite parts of my job. So I'm glad all of you have registered and you're attending today. Uh, I live down in Cedar City. And um, so I love the remote work. And my favorite part of my job is being able to go out and support all of the um, supervisors, division directors, um, and other leaders throughout the state and being able to serve you and support you in your abilities to support and develop um, all of the employees that we have here in the great state of Utah. A uh, quick shout out. So next month, um, we'll be sending a link in the chat a little bit later on. Uh, Tara Conley, one of our other specialists, is going to be presenting in June um, <clears throat> on how to prepare for these quarterly evaluations and how to reduce your rate or bias. As most of you should be aware uh, you will be required to meet quarterly now with each of your employees uh, regarding their performance um, plans and then how to reduce some of that rate or bias you might feel as you go to evaluate their performance at the annual evaluation so please uh, make sure you get registered for that and like i said we'll, we'll send a link out uh, today probably and a few more times after that All right, so as we uh, talk about performance today, a couple of things that I would like for all of you to keep in mind. Um, managing people is not near as easy as it is to manage objects or things. And so if we think about a race car and all the components that go into a, a race car, uh, it's pretty easy for us to see if a race car is going to be performing well. Um, if it's going fast, if it's staying in its lane, um, if it's not on fire, <laughs> if its tires aren't falling off, uh, those are some good indications, right, that that race car is probably going to be competitive during whatever race that they're in. Um, and then how quickly do we recognize when a race car is not <laughs> going to be performing well? Um, they might, you know, like I said, be on fire. They might be at the end of the um, pack of cars. Their tires could be rolling all over the track. Uh, there's lots of different things. It's really easy to visualize performance when we think about uh, the performance of a race car. And um, sometimes it might feel like in your jobs when you're managing uh, people that it would be really easy to, to see how um, poor or how well they're performing uh, based off of some of those uh, visual components. And so when we talk today on, uh, about performance, keep in mind, it's not always black and white um, because we are managing people. We're in the uh, public sector uh, work for a reason, and that's because we want to be helpful and care about other people. And um, in a supervisor role, you're tasked to be able to um, support them, develop them, help them to grow. Um, and to get to know them as a person and not just an employee. And so um, as we jump into this discussion, hopefully we can all have an open mind and realize that performance is not always black and white, that there's always going to be one-offs, there's always going to be weird things that happen, there's always going to be um, circumstantial uh, situations. 
and it does make it harder to, to manage performance as a supervisor, but we've got some tools and some ideas today to help support you in that as you navigate through managing performance going forward. Um, these are the four topics that I wanna make sure that we cover today, and hopefully this is what you came prepared to learn today. Um, and when we think about performance, it might come natural for you to just be thinking about your employees, especially with some of these new requirements to meet with them more regularly, um, to include performance standards, performance goals, behavioral expectations and their plans, all of those things. But today is not just about your employees. Today is about you as well as supervisors, your employees too and you're just as important and all of you have your own performance plans. So as we dive into the content, please be thinking about your teams and um, those that you support, but also think about yourself too. All right, so kind of from a macro level, when we talk about performance, um, interestingly enough, there is a um, institute that um, does international ratings uh, for each country, um, and it's based off of 230 different criteria. So out of 195 countries that we have worldwide, um, the United States is rated number one in our economic competitiveness, uh, which is pretty cool, <laughs> right? Um, but as we look at the other ratings, we're rated down at number 15 when it comes to employee education, training, and development. And what I believe that shows is that we, um, definitely care about making money and being competitive um, economically, but that we maybe don't spend as much time as we should investing in our employees and helping them to develop and grow. And um, that our priority is maybe more of the dollar sign rather than uh, caring about people. And, and mind you, this does include, you know, both private and public sector, so it's not just public sector work. But um, interestingly enough, uh, the second country that gets ranked for economic competitiveness is Singapore. Um, so they're right behind us, but they're actually rated number one when it comes to the employee education, training and development. So I think they're doing things right. Um, they're making money, but they're also putting um, employees first and giving them opportunities to grow and contribute to the good of their, their country. So um, that's kind of a macro level when we think about performance. Uh, so how does it affect us here in the state of Utah? Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen the US News report that came out uh, for this year, for 2023, but uh, our state actually is rated number one um, among all the states nationwide. And we're leading the nation in both um, economy and our fiscal stability. Um, but more specifically, it's with employment and growth. And part of that is because our population is increasing, of course, um, which then brings in more jobs. But I'd like to think out of the 21 thousand plus employees that we have in the state of Utah that we're contributing um, to those ratings as well. And so when we talk about performance improvement and managing performance and all things performance, it seems this, uh, this entire year and going forward, um, it is, it's a trending thing within our state and rightfully so it, it's helping us to want people to not only um, live in Utah, but to stay in Utah, to work in Utah, to grow in Utah, to have their families here. Um, and that's something we can all take pride in. So now when we um, think, okay, so we all work for the state, uh, making this even more micro now, how does that impact us as state employees? Um, what does performance mean within um, state government? And this is, uh, we're gonna watch a short clip here. This is um, our director of DHRM, John Barron, if you're not familiar, and it's just a quick two minute video, but he does address, um, performance here in this introduction video that he does. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and watch that. My name is John Barrett and I'm currently serving as the division director for the Division of Human Resource Management within the Department of Government Operations. I have the privilege of serving the 21,000 state employees uh, on a daily basis, whether it's uh, compliance, protection, development, success or engagement. We serve frontline employees, we serve mid-level managers, uh, and we serve uh, the senior level leaders, the cabinet level, as well as directly report to the governor. So every day, I think about what projects to progress based on um, what inputs are from those four significant customer bases. 
what has prepared me for it. I think I like to use the word as what is preparing me for it. And I think the biggest word that comes to mind for me is adaptability as a leader. Three years ago, um, no one expected to need to think about a, a global pandemic. However, the flexibility of to stop, pivot, and immediately go tackle a problem. Your goal is to serve leaders and their vision can change uh, month to month, year to year. So being adaptable and being able to relate to what they need done is extremely critical in helping me prepare or become a better HR professional for the state. We've put a really heavy focus on recruiting and developing an employee base in rural locations. We track how often people are getting interviewed and actually getting jobs for the state of Utah in rural locations. What we're attempting to do is get ahead of our systems. Uh, recently we were given uh, a large budget to go update how you even um, input your time or how you receive your paycheck or whether you can do it on a mobile app. Uh, we've also received funding to double down our investment in performance management for our employees. So I want high performers to re be rewarded and to progress. So the vision for me is to just continue to take a step towards modernizing the way that our leaders engage with our employees. And the last year has shown me that we have permission to do so, uh, we have the money to do so, uh, now it's up to us to actually strategically develop that plan. I, I can't wait. Yeah, so we want to thank John for that, um, especially with the last bit there, doubling down on performance management statewide. Um, and, and how does that impact you as supervisors? Well, a lot of this is falling on you. Um, and part of that and part of his vision here, and especially within our um, administration, is that uh, doing things differently, helping to modernize state government, um, having change occur and uh, managing performance is going to be part of that change. How are we going to be doing that differently? Uh, what are the new requirements as far as the HB 104, uh, the new law goes? Uh, but also uh, we, can, we can talk that high level and it sounds really good, but then it comes to each of you um, and the impact that you're going to have, the things that you're going to be needing to do differently. And part of that's even just having a different mindset, shifting your mindset of, and um, this is how it's always been done to what can I be doing differently? How can I better support my employees? Um, how can I manage performance better? Uh, and, and if things are going really well, how can you then give opportunities for your employees to learn from you so that they can be able to promote and move on and um, take leadership roles in the future as well? Uh, so setting that example, um, it's a big task <laughs> and a lot of uh, responsibility, obviously, being a supervisor in the state of Utah. And it might feel like a lot of pressure to us, some of these changes coming, but really all of you are equipped to be able to change and to be able to do things differently, especially if you have the right mindset to do it. Um, and, and like I said, I've mentioned HB 104 a couple of times, it referred to also as pay for performance. Hopefully we're all on the same page when we talk about that. Uh, but why I chose to do this topic and and do it specifically here for the month of May um, is it's really relevant. So part of the law requires that, that we provide training on best practices for addressing poor performing employees. And uh, for the required supervisor training that all of you um, are expected to take by July 1, it does include that in here, but we thought having a little bit further discussion, it's one of those things that everybody deals with as supervisors, but not a lot of support might be there or there might be a lot of resistance or hesitancy. Uh, pride might get in the way of thinking, I'm a manager, I can do it all. Um, I've got the skills, I've been in this for a long time. Or, you know, I, I don't know how to ask for help. Or, you know, it's not a big deal right now, so I'll deal with it next week. And then a year goes by and you're still dealing with some of those performance concerns that you have. So we'll talk through some of those things today. But that is why um, we chose a topic that we did today, uh, just so that it helps, hopefully gets you guys um, the resources that you need um, to be able to implement these changes and, and, and feel more confident in your ability to address poor performing or underperforming employees. All right, so for um, the, the first topic we're gonna cover today, I, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page that there is a, a very distinct difference between performance improvement and then discipline. Um, and so I've got a quick video here that we're gonna watch that defines that. Um, but at a minimum, um, we need to make sure that when you're writing your, your 
employees performance plans that it's not always just about improving performance, but that recognition and rewarding and all of those things can go in there as well. Um, it's about goal setting, uh, giving them opportunities, uh, growth opportunities, helping them to develop into who they wanna be, helping them to understand what their strengths are and not just a punitive plan. <laughs> um, and, and that's where if, if there are concerns that you have with performance, the disciplinary action might need to happen. So uh, this quick video does show exactly what those differences are. So we'll jump right into that. Performance improvement and the disciplinary process each have their own section in DHRM rules. However, the difference between the two and when each should be used is not exactly black and white. We're going to use this table to illustrate some of the differences between each process from the standpoint of perspective. What would generally cause you to employ each process? What is each intended to do? How long does each last? And who is the final authority on each? These questions might have very succinct practical answers that clearly point to one type or another, or they may seem to fall between the two. However, I do not want you to get too hung up about whether a particular action is performance improvement or discipline. What I want you to learn to do is to decide whether you would like to take a performance improvement approach to solving a problem or a disciplinary approach so that you can help your HR representative better assist you in selecting and implementing a solution. So first off, generally speaking, poor performance and some minor behavioral problems are best addressed with performance improvement, where outright misconduct and more serious behavioral problems typically warrant disciplinary actions. Minor behavioral problems that the employee fails to correct after performance improvement efforts may also be cause to consider the disciplinary route. Probably the clearest line between performance improvement and discipline can be drawn here, as we consider the intent and goal of each process. With performance improvement, you will assist your employees to develop through non-punitive coaching, training, and feedback. With discipline, you are punishing them for performance failures or acts of misconduct. If an employee physically assaults a member of the public while on the job, it really doesn't make sense to engage in performance improvement. Similarly, when an employee fails to complete a log on rare occasions, it doesn't really make sense to administer discipline. When you have problems with employees, it will always be useful to ask yourself whether the coaching and almost hand-holding approach of performance improvement or the harder-edged punitive disciplinary process will best address the issue at hand. Duration is a significant difference between the two approaches. A formal performance improvement plan will generally last 90 days. But even informal performance improvement efforts, like giving more regular feedback or providing additional training, will require ongoing efforts and follow-up by you. In contrast, discipline is usually very short in duration. State statute says that employees can be suspended up to 30 calendar days without pay, but it is rare to see a suspension in excess of two weeks. Demotions and dismissals are permanent actions, but once the decision is made, the penalty takes effect quickly. However, some performance improvement actions, such as a written warning to an employee for using unprofessional and foul language with a member of the public, may happen as quickly as a disciplinary action. So again, these are general characteristics, not hard, fast rules. Finally, performance improvement efforts are never grievable beyond the agency head. Most disciplinary actions can be grieved or appealed to the Career Service Review Office. We will look at the specifics of this in a later section of the training. But generally speaking, your agency head will be the final authority on performance improvement actions, while disciplinary actions can go to the Career Service Review Office. As you can see, these are general guidelines and not black and white differences between performance improvement and discipline. Sometimes it may be difficult to choose which method will be most effective. Do not be alarmed if this is the case. It means that you understand the process and are being thoughtful about the discharge of your duties. This is a good thing. All right, this um, video is, I think, about a decade old, um, but it does lay a nice framework down to understand uh, what the difference is. Sometimes when we hear performance improvement, we automatically think that there has to be discipline involved. Um, and then it kind of gets into that gray area, like I like this said, and then we were talking about earlier that it's not always black and white. So when does HR need to be involved? Um, 
how quickly should they get involved? Those might be a lot of questions um, that you have in your mind and not always sure of. So thankfully, um, we have got, um, I asked Brian Embley uh, to join us here today. He has worked uh, for HR for over 17 years and he is by all means uh, the performance improvement expert. He knows anything and everything there is to know about performance improvement. Um, not just a uh, PIP, but written warnings as well. And so um, he's going to take a few minutes and, and talk us through uh, some of these things that might be helpful resources for for all of you. Um, Brian, are you? Yes, I just saw you jump on. You're here. You're good to go. I'm here. I'm good. I had my camera and everything off because I didn't want to distract anybody with my stunning beauty. But I got to say that the whoever the voiceover on that last guy, that, that was really rough to listen to, you know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, good morning, everybody. I, it's great to be here and talk to you. You know, sometimes everybody, uh, people get uh, scared and intimidated to call HR. They don't want to because it feels like too heavy a hammer. And then you call up and you get instructions that you're not quite sure, uh, you know, how that's actually going to meet uh, or address your problems. And so we're, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and, I, and I understand that some of you may be here because boss said so, but we still appreciate you being here and uh, spending some time with us. So I wanna start uh, by talking about my other job right now. I'm a flight instructor. And I always tell my students that the sooner you notice a need for correction, the smaller correction you're gonna need to make. For example, if we're coming in to land and you notice that you're a little bit high, the solution is to pull out just a little bit of power. But if you let that ride too long, all of a sudden, we're going to need to pull out all of the power and dive for the runway or just simply have to do a go around, right? So noticing problems early and acting quickly makes for a smooth flight with a lot of small adjustments rather than a turbulent ride with steep and scary maneuvers. This same principle applies to performance management, okay? So the, we, we get the question, when does HR need to be involved? And the answer is the same as I, I tell my flight students, early and often, quick and small corrections. And then your conversation with HR and hopefully also your employee is going to be brief and maybe mildly unpleasant because you know nobody likes to sit down and say, hey, you're not doing well, but it's way better than saying, hey, I know I really haven't said much, but you're fired. Right. You don't want to go there. You don't want to sneak up on somebody like that. So if something's happening in the workplace that either you or your supervisor would not be happy with long term. Call HR. Get on it early. Get things taken care of. OK. And oh, and you're man, Sydney. It's like we're just talking through the or tele telepathically here. Um, <laughs> yeah, she went ahead to the next piece. So. Uh, the, the fundamental rules here, DHRM 470, R477.11 talks about uh, the disciplinary process. And you notice the piece that we've got there that requires management to consult with DHRM before administering discipline. The biggest reason for that is that there are some procedural steps that need to be taken care of. And we don't want a procedural misstep to mess up the substance of the action, right? So we're going to make sure that all those procedural checkboxes are taken care of. And then we're also going to provide some feedback and some coaching to make sure that the solution that you're implementing is actually going to realize the effect that you're looking for and get the changes that you're looking for. Or if it doesn't get those changes, that it lays the groundwork for actions down the road so that nobody has to live with the unpleasantries of of an untenable situation any longer than is absolutely necessary, okay? And then the, the next part of the rule is there in, in uh, 477.10. So 477.11, the title of that section is employee discipline, okay? 477-10 so is employee development. And that's where the rules are regarding written warnings and performance improvement plan. And once again, uh, we want to make sure, we want to be right there with you as a team member to help you develop these plans looking at the end right from the very get-go to make sure that no matter 
how the employee responds to your efforts, whether they be the performance improvement or the disciplinary efforts, that the agency is in a good place to continue on and take care of its uh, mission, whether the employee chooses to participate long-term or not. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide there, uh, Sydney. So supervision is a lot of work. We know that. We also know that from a systemic standpoint, most of you were chosen as supervisors because you were really good at doing the thing that you were doing, right? Not necessarily because you were uh, the best potential manager. And th there are a lot of reasons for that, and I'm not going to unpack that. That's, for, that's all for another day. But we recognize that a lot of you are in a situation where you're a supervisor very often over people who used to be your peers, and that can make it a little bit of an awkward situation. You want to do a good job, but it's not what you were trained to do. Very few of you went to school to be a manager, right? A lot of you went to school to be scientists, or you went to the post academy to be a, a, a law enforcement officer. Management wasn't what you did. That's why we're here to help, right? We, we, we see a lot of errors, and, and, and the errors go on both sides, actually. Uh, the most common ones we see are supervisors waiting too long to act. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, many of you supervise former peers, and it can be really hard to sit down with somebody who used to be your peer and have these unpleasant conversations with them. And so the natural tendency is to kind of push it off and, and not engage until all of a sudden now it's way too big we can't ignore it anymore and now it's a really unpleasant conversation right so that's the most common error we see but we also see employees on the opposite or excuse me supervisors on the opposite end of the spectrum who see the smallest little thing happen and bang they want to drop the knife and and be done with things and we we want to our role as hr is to help you design a, a solution that's going to fit that fits within the, the, your agency's vision, that fits within the procedures, that is gonna be legally defensible given any sorts of challenge that, challenges that happen, and that when you wake up in the morning, you know, a month from now or a year from now or sometime after this action, you're, you can look back on it and say, yeah, I did the right thing. It may have been unpleasant, but I did the right thing and what I needed to do, okay? So the next, I think the next uh, section gets us a little bit onto the nuts and bolts of a uh, written warning. So again, as we outlined, please contact HR early and often. The biggest reason on this one, they've got a lovely template for you to use. It makes these things a whole lot easier. And, I, and before we get too much in the nuts and bolts, I will say that the written warning is, in my opinion, the most underutilized tool by management in the state of Utah. If we issued a lot more of these, we wouldn't have to do nearly as much discipline because it would be early, smaller corrections instead of huge course changes to get back on, on course, right? So step one is contact HR. And anytime somebody's performance isn't meeting standards, anytime somebody has a, an issue of misconduct that is not workable right somebody's coming in late all the time well that's not workable get in touch with hr that doesn't mean we have to drop a huge heavy hammer we do need to deal with it so that we don't have a huge correction later right uh so the step two there is and this is built into the template you're going to describe the the conduct or performance that was at issue and here many of us write the way we talk which doesn't make for the greatest writing and we also tend to be very me-centric, right? You see a couple of, uh, one example right there on the screen where we say, we want to write, I saw you come into work tw late twice last week. Well, if that's what you write in the, in the written warning, what is that teaching the employee not to do? It teaches them not to let you see them come in late to work, right? The problem was you seeing them as it's written rather than saying, hey, you were late on this day and this day. Well, now they understand that the problem is being late, right? And you may be thinking, oh, geez, come on, they understand. You have not seen these things argued at the Career Service Review Office and in court. Employees will dig on to any little thing to say, hey, you just said you didn't want to see me coming into work late. 
And we've literally had employees who would just wait outside until the boss goes to lunch and then they come in. You didn't see me. Ask, yeah. <laughs> At least twice, that specific thing. So don't, when you, when you write up the problem, describe the problem as you did this or you didn't do this. Doesn't need to be a ball peen hammer, but it does need to be they were the ones who did it, right? And if it was you who did it, own it, right? Have a conversation with somebody and say, yeah, this didn't work out the way it should have. My part is this, your part is this, right? Nothing wrong there. So uh, the third step there, uh, once you've described the conduct or whatever happened that uh, led to the written warning, you're gonna cite the applicable policies. And this is one of those things that ends up getting into some of the procedural, more legally stuff, setting the table for down the road. Uh, but it also helps uh, the employee know where they can look to see uh, where the are, uh, expectations of them are articulated, right? They can know, hey, yeah, I've got to be to work on time. It says so right here in the policy, right? And then finally, the, the fourth step there, and the reason we have it worded this way, to leave untouched uh, the warning, is that we, we give out, send out this template all the time, and managers want to just wipe out the warning. The warning simply says that, hey, this is the purpose of this document is to bring a matter to your attention that requires increased effort uh, at, or an, inc uh, excuse me, a recurrence of this may lead to disciplinary action. And a lot of managers balk at that. They don't want to put a threat, because that's what it is, right? We'll use the softer term of warning, but they don't want to put that in the document because it's unpleasant to deliver. But if you don't tell someone what the consequences of either continued poor performance or misconduct is going to be, then they're going to come back and say, you never told me it was that big of a deal, right? So leave the warning there. It needs to be there so that the employee understands and knows, hey, discipline is in your future if you don't make a change here, right? I was about to ask any questions. We got way too many people on the call to just take questions. But the, uh, the next piece is the, the performance improvement plan. And as was on that little uh, blue table earlier, generally speaking, when we're looking at performance improvement, we're, this is more of the hand-holding effort, right? A couple of uh, preliminary matters. You're generally not going to put anybody who is on probation on a performance improvement plan. And the reason why is that the purpose of a performance improvement plan is to bring somebody back to an acceptable level of performance, not to get them there in the first place. That's what initial training's for, right? And if we did a bad job at initial training, then we need to fix that, right? That, that's a management, an HR problem, not an employee problem. But if they've been properly trained and they at one point did a good job and now they're not doing that anymore, that's when we put in the performance improvement plan. And we're going to put in there, uh, we're going to say, hey, look, you've been falling short on these performance standards. One, two, three. We're going to describe what was happening with them briefly. But then we're going to describe the way forward. We're going to say, I want to see you improving item number one in this way. Maybe it's getting timely reports handed in, or maybe it's a, the, the quality of the calculations on their uh, spreadsheet. Whatever it is, we're going to describe what we want to see from them. And then... Step three there, we're going to meet regularly and provide feedback. And by regularly, we mean at least weekly, okay? Well, we mentioned earlier, these are typically in place for 90 days. There's nothing magic about that time frame. Um, you know, we, we had a uh, 911 dispatcher that worked for DPS once that we needed to uh, put on a performance improvement plan. This person literally deals with life and death matters. 90 days didn't make sense for a performance improvement plan because somebody had to be right over their shoulder making sure that nobody was going to die if they made a mistake, right? So that one was a 30-day performance improvement plan, and they met twice a week to provide the feedback, right? The key is going to be consistent feedback from you as the manager, and that's why this one, we, we call it a little bit of hand-holding because it's going to take a lot of consistent effort from you, but it's probably going to take less effort than training a new employee. And that's why we're going to give this the effort we can to bring somebody back to an acceptable level of performance 
rather than just sending them down the road if there's any hope at all that we can get them back there, right? So that's going to be how a PIP works. And again, just like a, a written warning, the uh, your HR specialist that you contact in your agency, they've got a template for you. And, you know, as Sydney said earlier, none of this is black and white straight up. So the template should be viewed just as that, a template. Well, there are some pieces in there, like I mentioned to the written warning, you got to leave the warning. Otherwise, it's not a written warning. It's just a here's what happened memo. Right. So there, there are a couple of pieces that you're going to leave in there. But for the most part, these are designed to be flexible, to, to bend to the your agency's mission and vision, not only in what job you have to get done by the, your, your agency's statutory mission, but in the way that your management team likes to see it done. We can account for all of that as we use these various tools. But again, it's going to be most effective and easiest to make the course corrections if we notice it and act early rather than waiting until way too long and then we have to do a go around and when you want to just be on the ground, we don't want to do a go around again and again and again because we waited too long to make the appropriate correction. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. It's a lot of content to cover in a short amount of time, but I appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, this this page here, we will be sharing these slides like we do uh, with all the off the shelves. Um, they are links, so you can have access to those templates. Um, if you are in a situation with an employee uh, where you need to um, work with HR, um, make sure that you contact your specialist to help you um, get these drafted as well. So uh, I know that there's a little bit of stigma, Brian touched on that, of, of contacting HR and, and maybe feeling like I can manage this on my own. Uh, but really, like he said, if you get involved early and often, um, anytime you have a concern, there's there's protection for you as the supervisor to to make your job easier uh, going forward. But also we're at that point utilizing taxpayer dollars the best way that we should be. Um, all of us here <laughs> are paid with taxpayer dollars. And so um, when performance is under par, that's your jobs as supervisors to make sure that it, it you bring their performance or you turn it back to that appropriate level. So uh, Brian touched on some good points there. Appreciate uh, Brian again for you to join us. So uh, we're going to jump in and we've got two more sections here to cover um, in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but uh, these two things are hopefully some, some practices and some resources that will help you feel uh, more confident in, in your ability to manage performance, especially when it's not maybe going well. Uh, so there's two sides of this. You you have all of you are, are tasked with probably supervising more than one employee. And um, it's okay if you're not, but um, you're held accountable for their performance as a team, um, whether that's staying within budget, whether it's meeting deadlines, uh, whether that's answering to the public or, or working with other state agencies. Um, there's accountability on your end on how your teams are performing. And when they aren't performing <laughs> um, as well as they should be, it, it might be challenging for you to know how to address that. And so um, just a reminder that performance doesn't always have to be individual. It can be um, uh, an, an entire challenge with, the, with your team. Um, when you think about uh, those that are involved with any kind of grant or federally funded programs, or if you've got regional um, outcomes or, or data that you've you've got to show audits, um, specific projects. I, I often think about all the big projects that UDOT works on um, and how they have to perform as a team in order to complete uh, a lot of those projects. And so uh, it's not just an individual effort at times. And, and once again, if you're managing those teams um, and, and things aren't going well, um, what can you do about it? Uh, so we're going to talk about the race car example here again, but the three biggest reasons why a team might be underperforming, um, you've got somebody that's made an, a mistake, right? And then maybe the blame game happens um, or maybe some shaming happens uh, and, and that, that's not helpful for the rest of the team. Um, there might be strained interpersonal dynamics. You know, maybe you've got uh, new employees and more experienced employees and they're trying to find that balance or maybe it's just personality differences. There just might be some uh, constraint there uh, or some strain there. And then um, lack of communication. You know, maybe somebody knows the best way to, 
to do something and they're not sharing or maybe there's some lack of transparency maybe people just aren't communicating not at all or they're not communicating well so those are some of the challenges that you might be running into but um when we think about a race car uh, i did some research on this and it was pretty intriguing they talk about when you want to build um, a race car uh, the first steps that you need to do and before you even think about having a race car that's going to perform well or or to win um you have to your number one goal and first goal is to actually build an a rated team um you you focus on the team first rather than the actual uh car and so when you start out you might have this a plus rated team but only uh have a, a, a c c rated uh machine that you're working on but as your team continues to improve and learn and grow from each other uh, year over year, uh, the product changes, it improves as well, right? So that car that you've been working on is going to get better and better as the team gets better and better. So then eventually you have not just an A rated team, but then also an A rated car. Um, that the flip side of this, that it, it's impossible to have a C rated team develop or build an A rated car. Uh, and so when we apply that to public sector work or state government work, um, the, the better performing that your team is doing, the better uh, support and services that we're providing to the public. And we can't provide the best uh, service um, to the citizens in our state and, and to one another, frankly, if we're not performing well as a team. So here's a, a few tips on what you can do as a supervisor. Um, one thing to remember is that you're, you don't have control over what your employees are going to do or not do. And that might be challenging at, time, at times, but what you do have control over is how you're going to respond and what you're able to do. And um, so here's, here's seven things to think about um, that, and we'll break these down here in just a second, that can help you to be a better supervisor, help you uh, gain more confidence, help you maybe have some humility, help you be able to learn and grow and develop too. Um, not just as a supervisor, but as a person and as an employee as well. Um, so let's go through each of these. Uh, the first step here is to realize you're not in this alone. So when you're talking to your supervisor um, about your performance uh, and maybe the, the feedback's not as great as you want it to be or because your team's not performing well or, or maybe you're not performing well, um, the one thing that you can do is realize that you're not alone. So as mentioned, we have over 21,000 employees in the state of Utah um, and just over 4,000 managers that support those 21,000 employees. And so um, I, I think we have probably about 500 of you on the call right now. I can't see the numbers exactly, but a big chunk of you, um, you've got the experience that you need uh, to be able to be in the roles that you're in and that's why you're there but you're not in this alone. Um, so don't feel like you can't reach out to peers within your own agency. You know, what have they done that's been helpful or what, what do they do that wasn't helpful and you can learn and grow from them, but also check in with other agencies too. Um, that might feel a little bit weird, but anytime you're managing and leading, uh, those skills are the same regardless of what agency uh, you're, you're appointed with. So um, use each other. Uh, the second thing is, is remember anytime you get feedback there's always a little bit of a caveat uh, definitely take accountability um, for your team and their actions or or what they're not doing <laughs> um, but it might be time for you to look at uh, a better effort and a better plan for how you're implementing the work that your employees are being asked to do uh, focus on your strengths as their manager uh, what do you know that you do well ask them what they think that your strengths are um, and what you could be doing differently um, and then, of course, like I said, this is about you, not just your employees. Um, remind your manager of what you think is going well. Um, anytime we talk about performance, sometimes there's this stigma that it always has to be a negative thing. You know, it's underperforming, but there's always good things going on. And sometimes when you're dealing with the, the negativity, we forget to be reminded of the, the positive things. And so when you're talking with your manager, um, it's okay to remind them of, hey, this is what is going well. Uh, talking about positivity and negativity, avoid the negative thoughts. <laughs> um, you know, we all have heard negativity attracts negativity, right? Ruminating about um, situations is not going to be helpful and it's not going to transform the situation. So uh, 
you need to focus on what you can control and you make a plan and you move forward. And this is, is for you as the supervisor, um, not for your employees. Um, it's not helpful to play the blame game. Um, remember that your employees are always watching you <laughs> and how you're responding. And so if you're choosing to respond negatively to a situation, um, they're going to learn from that just like children learn from their parents, right? Uh, and, and so make sure that every action that you're taking, um, remind yourself that your employees are watching how you're going to respond to all those situations. And once again, your employees that you have are going to be future leaders someday if they want to be. They're going to take your job perhaps someday. And what do you want to be teaching them? Um, when you do make mistakes, when things uh, don't go as well as they should, um, take that accountability and let your employees see that. Constantly model for them um, the behaviors that you want to see in them as employees. Uh, another helpful thing is <laughs> um, when you've maybe got some feedback from your uh, boss and you've been able to take some time to have your head get cleared, follow up with them. Um, thank them for letting them um, or thank them for talking to you about their concerns. Um, you know, when, and then this trickles down when you meet with your employees how nice for them to be able to come back to you and say, thank you for, for letting me know your concern or I didn't realize I was doing this. Um, like Brian mentioned, those little bit uncomfortable uh, conversations um, go a lot smoother and there's a lot more growth and development that happens rather than waiting and delaying and having it be a hard conversation, especially for those that are in roles where you maybe did work with your peers. So um, when, when you're getting feedback, ask for it directly. It's best to do it face to face and let your boss know what you need. Um, that might seem a little bit weird, but uh, just like your employees call you and, and want to know what's best for them um, when they're trying to improve their performance, no different for you as a supervisor. Once again, you're constantly modeling the behavior that you want your employees to be able to do. So um, it's okay to let your boss know, hey, you know what, this is new for me, or you know what, I didn't even know how to be a manager. I'm doing the best I know how to do. What else can I be doing differently? Who can teach me? What resources do we have? Um, can I have some time? Can you talk, you know, talk through this with me? What did you do um, when you were learning? All of those things are okay. Um, another tip here is look at your own leadership style. There's, there's lots of research um, and researchers out there that have different leadership styles. So it's okay if you haven't seen this one before or you've seen other versions. The idea is just knowing what leadership styles come naturally for you. Um, Daniel Goleman here, he's known for six leadership styles. And uh, the, the cool thing about leadership styles is you're not just one all the time and you shouldn't be but that you should be able to learn how to have any of these leadership styles based off of the situation that you're at with your employees. Um, you know, you're going to be uh, supporting a, a new employee differently than you're supporting an experienced employee. And having that flexibility is tough and challenging, but most effective for the employees that you're supporting. Um, there's some questions here on that you can ask yourself um, that might be helpful as well. Well, that will be helpful when you're uh, meeting with your team to to have them know what kind of leader you're tr trying to be and then recognizing what kind of leadership style or what kind of approach you need to take with them when you have these conversations regarding their their performance um i think this is probably one of the best things uh managers can do supervisors can do um so if your team's made a mistake or they've underperformed bring it back to the team it's not on you to fix it um, it's on them. And so how do they want to tackle it? How do they want to take accountability? What kind of goals do they want to set for themselves? Um, how are they going to work through this? Um, in, in the courses that I teach and every conversation that I have, um, I always try to remember managers that we shouldn't be doing things for employees that employees can be doing for themselves. And as a supervisor, that's something you want to be aware of. It, it might be really easy. And of course, maybe quicker for you to just solve the problem and uh, but what you've done is then denied them an opportunity to learn and especially if they're the ones that are accountable for it so um, please don't deny your your employees opportunities to learn and to take accountability and once again you being able to to model that behavior and to help coach them um, through some of those tough challenges they're going to take ownership if they're involved in the process and not just being told what to do to correct uh, the behavior 
And, and then lastly here, it's okay to be selfish, uh, at least a little bit. Um, <laughs> most of your time, I'm sure, is spent thinking about your employees, uh, their, their well-being, um, and of course, their performance, uh, their professional lives, their personal lives, um, concerns that you might have, thinking about the good things um, that are happening as well. <laughs> There's so much energy that gets exerted um, when you focus on your employees. Uh, often supervisors neglect focusing any energy on themselves. Um, and like I've mentioned a few times today, it is okay to think about you. <laughs> You're an employee as well. Um, you have strengths and needs and opportunities to learn and grow and develop just as much as your employees do. Um, so uh, when you're thinking about your own performance, um, what kind of goals are you wanting to, to set for yourself? Um, schedule time to, to talk to your, your manager, your boss about it. Um, and, and maybe that's just how to do things differently. Um, a lot of the supervisors we have in the state have been in those positions for a long time, and that brings a lot of experience. Um, and so what opportunities do you have to share that experience with others? And, and me, maybe that even means your direct reports. Um, don't hold on to your experience, um, but also make sure that you're thinking about you and, and what your future uh, holds um, for the rest of your career. All right, and then the last topic here is just, okay, what, what happens when I've got poor performing employees? And so here's some uh, best practices that we can review. So uh, these 10 items here, you take a screenshot of it or, or wait for the, the uh, video to be posted, but these are probably the most helpful things when it comes to any uh, employees that you have that are underperforming. And the number one thing, I think number one and number 10 are the most important. Don't ignore the problem. Um, even if you're tired, even if you don't have the time, even if you don't think it's going to happen again, um, it will, <laughs> and then it becomes a bigger problem. Um, so don't ignore it. Address it right away, even if it means an uncomfortable conversation, even if it means having to readjust your schedule. Uh, like Brian encouraged all of you um, early and often, um, and especially if it's a concern, you know, concerns are what turns into problems and then problems usually turn into discipline and uh, no supervisor wants to take the time to have to, to work through that. Um, and for those that have been involved in that kind of a process with uh, employees before, know the amount of time it takes and the energy that it takes and the morale impact it has on the rest of your team and everything else and your own energy. Um, so being able to recognize and, and, um, talk to your employees about your concerns right from the get-go um, is going to save a lot of energy in the future that um, isn't necessary to exert. So, um, And then, of course, just talk about what could be causing the problem. Ask other people what you might be missing um, and the concern that you have. Of course, you're going to talk to the your employee. Um, and then the big thing here is, is that person coachable? Are they going to take accountability? Are they going to recognize, even if they don't agree, um, hear, hear them out, ask them what they think. Um, once again, employees uh, usually respond better when they're being asked rather than being told. And, and then if you need to, you know, you make a plan, help monitor, respect that confidentiality. That can be hard, um, especially if their performance is impacting other people that you, you manage, but uh, confidentiality is key. Um, and then, if there hasn't been improvement after all of that, you need to take the action and you've got the resources now and um, to know how to, to move forward with that. And then the last thing here too, um, like I said, number one, number 10, uh, praise and reward positive change. Um, we all like to hear when things are going well and then what we're doing well and what our strengths are. And as supervisors, once again, that's something you have in your own control to be able to acknowledge your employees and to recognize them for the good works that they're doing, um, but also to share your concern out of respect for them as an employee, right? Give them the opportunity to see things differently um, and to be able to, to grow and develop from that. Um, we all know that if we want to get better at something, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of time and making a lot of mistakes. And it's, it's okay to allow your employees to make those mistakes, you know, when they're willing to correct it and, and learn and grow from it, just like all of us have, um, especially to get into a leadership role. Uh, I, I thought it was appropriate to, to bring this up because I'm sure we've all had employees at some point, um, and maybe we've even been one 
one of these kind of employees ourselves, but that think that everything's just always going great and that there's nothing ever wrong. <laughs> and so how do you manage that? Um, uh, so make sure that you're being clear about what the expectations are. You're providing them with resources and support. And, and then you make that decision. Is it going to be in the best interest of your team, of the agency, of the department, um, to keep investing in that individual? Or is it better to support them in, in, in another uh, position or another role or another agency even? Um, you know, what's the best investment there? And then, you know, assessing whether they're going to accept help or not. And then make sure that you're targeting praise carefully. You've got employees that always think that their ter uh, performance is terrific. Um, it might be because that's the way you set them up to fill by the, the praise that you're giving. So maybe addressing praise differently um, or being more specific on, on your concerns. And then when you do uh, praise them, being specific on what uh, actual performance standard or um, behavior um, they're doing that is well received. All right, here's some performance principles to remember. <laughs> um, once again, take action as soon as possible. Um, the sooner you intervene with, with your employees, and intervene is probably a, a strong word there, but communicate um, with your employees. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal process, right? Uh, there's so many different ways to communicate now. Um, find the one that's best for, for you and your employees. Um, and consider what might be contributing to the performance issues. Hear them out. Give them opportunity to let them share with you uh what their side of the story basically and and maybe your perception isn't reality and maybe their perception isn't reality but between the two of you you can work through it together and then of course make whatever kind of plan you have in place but the big thing on your end is to make sure that you're following up it's one thing to just say hey you know i uh you came in late um and then if you don't ever address it again and they keep coming in late, that's on you as the manager, right? So even though it takes some extra energy there, making sure that you're following up. Um, don't waste your time trying to coach someone who's unwilling to admit there's an issue. Um, if you've got employees like that, once again, reach out to HR and talk through those things. Um, and then it's okay when you, you've got multiple concerns that are affecting the entire team, talk to your team as a whole and, and let them... Um, figure out what's going to to work best to resolve those issues but what we don't want to do is talk about individual individual performance issues um, with the rest of their team members all right so um you all know that you're going to be evaluating performance um every agency is doing that just a little bit differently but every agency is doing that every manager has to do that for their employees um, so one of the best uh, tips here when you go to do that evaluation, ask your employees to evaluate themselves. Let them come prepared uh, to these uh, meetings with you, um, these conversations with you when you're doing the plans and, and have those conversations. Um, once again, um, and when employees have the opportunity to be listened to by their, their managers rather than just being told about their performance, it's going to be a bit of an easier conversation. Um, just right here as we're closing up, a couple things that will continue to help support all of you as supervisors as you implement a lot of these changes. Um, we are kind of blitzing the state, going around and teaching these optional Apple courses. Um, we're just getting through this first quarter um, about writing uh, performance plans. Uh, registration opens up tomorrow for the next course that will go for the next three months and that's all about how to have better communication between you and your employees successful one-on-ones delivering feedback all of that so look for that registration tomorrow um, we are they are in-person classes um, and they are being offered statewide so um, that's another resource that's available to you that can be helpful and timely as you get ready to start um, writing plans july 1 and uh having those conversations with your employees. In addition here, a, a bunch more resources. Um, these are all hyperlinks as well that um, you can check out and, and view on your own time that might be helpful to you as well as supervisors as you continue to improve your efforts and how you manage performance. Um, once again, shout out, I think Shane put in the chat a couple times. Um, next month's off the shelf, gonna be timely again. Um, knowing what's expected with quarterly evaluations and helping reduce that rater bias. Uh, Tara Conley is going to be doing that. It's going to be awesome. I know she's well prepared for that. So please plan to register and join. Um, I think it's June 28th uh, for next month. 
And I know there's a lot of content to cover, um, but just appreciate the work that you do to help support the employees that we have in the state. Um, and uh, hopefully this, this uh, webinar has been um, a good resource for you and, and helping to build your confidence, maybe setting a, aside some of that pride or the humility to, to ask for help if you need it um, or to know what's available to you to help you build that confidence, to have conversations with your employees, to empower them, but also to make sure that they're performing the way that they need to perform. Um, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.